welcome to a new spring season of Elon Phoenix Weekly. Telly and I are back in the Jane and Brian Williams studio sitting here at the Edwards desk and let me tell you it couldn't possibly get better than this. We're so excited to kick off the fantastic season by first bringing back one of our favorite segments, the Game of the Week. So we head to JMU where Elon Phoenix men's basketball team was taking on the Dukes in a CAA rivalry late in CAA play. We started off with Simon Fuller with a quick one dribble pull up and then coming back down the other way, Matt Lewis for the Dukes. Elon, JMU going back and forth, Simon Wright with the little leaner in the left hand. JMU coming back down the other way. Darius Banks from the corner. And of course, McIntosh making things happen to Chuck Hanna lays it off. And the lay in good. Simon Wright hands it off to Hunter Mack. Splash from beyond the zone. Now Chris Wooten has a chance and Elon takes a wide lead. But do not take the Dukes out of it after this Chuck Hanna layup off the assist from McIntosh. Another three from Marcus Sheffield. He's been incredible all year long. Do not let the Dukes come back in this. Matt Lewis again. Darius Banks now inside. JMU furthering the comeback. And they just keep hitting shots. Dukes one after another taking runs. Get it within four off of that layup by Zach Jacobs. The steal by Darius Banks. Looking like they're going to draw back further, but Sheffield from behind keeps Elon in it. Hunter Mack with another, gets the roll and extends the lead more. Hunter McIntosh again from the wing. And how about Federico Poser inside, using the leverage, using the body, and then Poser again, finishing it off. Elon wins it, 70-62. On February 16th, Elon's women's basketball team played in their annual Play for K game. The Play for K Foundation supports cancer research and is named after Kay Yao, Elon's very first women's basketball coach before going on to be one of the most influential coaches in women's basketball history. Take a look at how our team celebrated the event. We have a great opportunity to celebrate the life and the legacy of Kay Yao who of course um, battled breast cancer fiercely and created the KL Fund. When we went around in our huddle the other day in practice, I asked our players to raise your hand if you have someone in your family that has been affected by cancer, and pretty much everyone raised their hands. And so, you know, cancer touches a lot of lives, and a lot of people have been affected by it, and so anything that we can do to help in the fight, you know, we want to get behind it 100%. Once we heard about the Play for K game, we couldn't help but want to partner with the athletic department here at Elon. We had our entire chapter come, help set up. We had the honorary coach, Maria LaChapelle, who's someone near and dear to Zeta's heart. Um, it was a great, great turnout. We met with all the survivors. There were 23 that came and met so many incredible women. <laughs> It definitely makes it more personal for us because Kay Yao was the first head women's basketball coach here at Elon. And so we definitely want to make her proud. And for me to follow in the footsteps of a legend, you know, that's something that's pretty remarkable. And so we want to make her proud and we want to do our part in contributing to the Kay Yao Cancer Fund. Um, it was a, a really intense game tonight. A lot of, it looked like a lot of bad calls to me, but you know, the girls just really, really pushed through. Very proud of them, and I'm proud of what this community has done, not only for um, for people like me, but raising awareness about breast cancer. I think is just awesome. Personally, it's been something that um, I have to support. In fact, if you see, um, I got uh, received a whole glass full of uh, warm notes to help me through my journey. So I wore one of them today just in honor of Zeta. So. I feel supported, I feel loved, and um, I also feel very, very grateful. That's truly amazing. I love seeing teams getting behind something so special. Well, yeah, and they may not have won the game, but when it all comes down to it, 
it's not going to be remembered who won. It's going to be the impact that they had on the foundation. Up next, walk the warning track with Elon Baseball's ace and see me take some shots from our women's lacrosse team. If I had to pick something that I'm taking from Elon, I want to take that can-do mentality. I don't think the world needs another person talking about how many problems we have. I think the world needs people who are going to go out there and do something about them. Coming into college, I knew that I wanted to do some kind of journalism in broadcast capacity with has to do with sports. I also come from a big sports family. Everyone else went to really big ACC schools and I wanted that, but on a smaller scale and Elon provided just that. I loved their communication school. I loved how innovative it was, what they were doing here. All of the amenities they have, the studios and cameras was super appealing to me. I accepted Elon just because, you know, I was kind of eager and just really wanted to just start getting into it. Uh, and Elon really gave me the best opportunity. I just got an email after I was accepted and uh, they said, hey, do you want to be uh, part of the Maroon Sports Broadcasting cohort? And I said, yeah, of course. Being in the cohort taught me a lot of things that I didn't even no, I didn't know or was even interested in. Um, it gave a lot of really cool opportunities that I don't think I would have gotten without being in the cohort. I was really all in and doing really everything I could uh, and they really kind of jump-started me in getting the opportunities I wanted. I'm so glad I joined these organizations not only to gain experience but to gain friendships and also people that I can rely on and I know that I'll be working with in the future when we're all in the professional world. We understand the grind and the hustle of being a sports video person. Um, so these are the people that I'll continue to be friends with after school and also that are gonna help me in the professional realm. I think what Elon Sports Vision can do is give them a wide array of opportunities and show them all of the different possibilities that are available in the sports video world. A bigger school that's maybe more prestigious for sports broadcast, you would never get these opportunities because they're all professional guys or graduates that are, are trying to make it big and get to the next level. And so your underclassmen or your undergraduates don't have the opportunities that uh, we're given here at Elon. I think Elon Sports Vision is you know, a place where really anyone can just come and have that passion be fueled. With the departure of Elon Baseball's top two starters to the draft last year, there's a new face on the mound on Fridays for the team. Jared Weatherby, a junior pitcher, took the time to talk some shop with our very own Javik Blake. Two strike three at the knees. Big breaking pitch and a big swing and a miss from Miguel Rivera. See what he goes with here. Two-two pitch with one out. Swing and a miss, strike three. One-two. Strike of the knees. And the third straight batter struck out by Jared Weatherby gives him four on the out. Welcome inside a special edition of Walk the Warning Track. I'm J. Blake, alongside junior pitcher Jared Weatherby. Jared, first off, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's go for a walk. We're going to walk a pole. We're not going to kind of run a pole. We'll make it a little easier for you today. All right. But we were just talking about how last year you got to pitch behind Kirby. You got to pitch behind Brnovich. This year, a new role for you. What are your kind of expectations for this season as the number one guy in the rotation? You know, I mean, like I, like I was telling you earlier, it's, it was such a great opportunity to pitch behind those guys and to learn from them. And I think it, it puts me in a better position than ever this year to, to not only be you know the, you know the Friday guy on the field but also help out a young staff that you know as, as I was saying it's, it's often tough time it's, it's often tough at Division One baseball to, to to get the rope so quickly and I think that's sort of my job is to help out a young staff get ready to go. 
And you say, talk about helping that young staff. Is there anything you're passing down, maybe the number one thing you learned from Kirby and Brnovich that you're passing down to these younger guys? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is always about consistency. You know, you got to come in, you got to develop a routine, you got to stick to it. And I think a lot of times, you know, especially as a freshman, you know, you want to come in, you want to make a big splash. And you know, sometimes you get going a little bit too quick. And I think the biggest thing is to have a consistent routine that you like, that you enjoy. And, when you, when you come down on the field, always be working with an intent. Mm -hmm. And this summer, you played in the Cape Cod Baseball League, obviously pitched in some of, against some of the best talent in collegiate baseball. What was that experience for you like? Uh, it, was, it was really awesome. I mean, it was, it was twofold for me. You know, I got to pitch, like you said, against some of the best you know, college players in the country. And, you know, the other thing for me is, you know, being a Massachusetts native, I got to pitch close to home for the first time in, in two years. You know, that was a great thing for me, and it was a great thing for my family, too. So. <laughs> It was it was a lot of fun, you know. Got to pitch, pitch against some great guys. Got to pitch with some great guys. You know, it's a, definitely an experience I'll take with me. How awesome was it to pitch in the Cape League? Had you gone to Cape League games as a kid? Were you familiar with the league a lot? Um, I had gone to a couple of games. Um, it was more of you know from when I had started being in college, I had known you know teammates who had gone down, you know friends who had gone down, and you know after they were telling me about the whole experience, and I was you know more excited than ever to get down there last summer. And do you have a favorite moment? I know you pitched in or was appeared in, was a part of a game that went 15 innings against Katuit in game two of the Cape League Finals. Yeah. Do you have a favorite moment from this season? Um, you know, I think that championship series was, was something that I'll, that I'll hold on to forever. I mean, it's, you know, it didn't really work out for, for Harwich, for my team, but, you know, it was, it was so much fun. The atmosphere there, it was, it was, it was all about baseball. There was nothing <laughs> else that anyone was worrying about. It was all just about playing baseball, and that was, that was really awesome. So you're going to get the start tomorrow against Indiana State, a Friday start. What's sort of your pregame routine like? What, what, what time do you get to the field? What time do you start your bullpen? Is there any sort of little quirks you do that kind of, kind of gets you in the mood? Um, you know, I generally get to try to get down here about an hour before game time, and I'm probably starting to stretch by about you know 35 minutes before. Getting on the mound about 15 minutes before, and I think the one sort of superstition that I have is after I'm all done, after I throw my pen, I like to come down a couple minutes early. I'll be right outside the dugout. I like to do like a couple few stretches, and you know, the funny thing about having such a young team is I was doing my stretch, and none of the team was realizing that I was doing the splits <laughs> over in front of the dugout. So it was, that's kind of like the little superstition I have. Is there a go-to song you have before you go out on the mound? Uh, you know, there's a couple. You know, there's a playlist I like to stick to. You know, a lot of hard, a lot of hard rock, a lot of classic rock, just. I'm just trying to get myself in the right mindset, but I don't think I have a go-to song more of a playlist. Seems like the standard playlist for any baseball player. It's got to include either country or rock music, yeah. but I think the most important question to ask here, you can go to school in North Carolina, so obviously you have to go to cookout at least twice a week. What's your go-to cookout order? Ooh. Oh, it's been a while. It really has been, but I think, you know, I'm kind of a wild card. I like to go with a hot dog tray. Wow. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit out there, but... That's kind of what I like to go to. A hot dog. You don't hear that too often. Well, we've made it down the right field line. This is Jared Weatherby. I'm Javik Blake. We just walked the warning track. A hot dog tray from Cookout? I don't know about that. But Javik's always uh, finding yeah. fun stuff to do with the athletes yeah. here on campus. Good luck to Jared and the rest of the team for the remainder of the season. On Valentine's Day this past February, Elon's Women Influencers in Sport put on an outstanding event which brought remarkable women here to Elon to speak of their experiences of being a woman in the sport industry. We had a chance to talk to some of these special women. Let's hear what they have to say. I would say that women in sport is definitely a growing trend. Um, women are involved in sport, are engaged in sport, want to work in sport, and I think there are more opportunities um, every year for women to continue to work in sport. Women in sports have definitely increased. Every time I go into a facility and I see more women on the admin side as well as the athletic side, it truly makes me realize that as a whole we've truly come together as a team um, and a diverse group to know that women truly are empowered in what they do and say. Uh, I think it's getting there. I would say that there have been huge strides even since I entered the workforce and I got my law degree and got my first job in sports about uh, eight or nine years ago. I have seen just the, the numbers at our own company, um, you know, the women I've met along the way. Um, I think we're seeing more and more women leaders in, in higher up leadership positions and I think that with them in those positions they're only going to bring up more rising stars. Um, and to eventually be in those positions like themselves. Where my mother fought to have soccer teams in my town, um, to where we are now, where it's the norm, I see the progress. So I think more women 
are participating in sports, women and girls, than ever before. I know when I was younger, I didn't think about it. The other side of working in this um, industry, because I was a student athlete, but now working in it, um, I see a lot more opportunities than I have before, and I feel like there is a lot of chances for me to level up and grow in, in this industry. You know, I think there's so much to be excited about. We are having so many innovative things going on where we're having first assistant coaches named in very male-dominated industries, so it's very exciting to see what's going on in the NFL and in the NBA, etc. But I would say that we still have a lot of work to do. We can always have more women in the room talking about Power 5 football or Power 5 basketball or any other uh, big picture things. Again, we are, we're in a good place, but there's definitely room to grow. Seeing other women in these roles and knowing that it is an option um, and just being able to you know, prove yourself and continue to educate yourself to work in those positions. Especially with having a female in the Super Bowl, um, I think it's only going to encourage and, and empower and give young women um, confidence that that's a possibility for them. I think it's awesome. These, these females who are getting hired in the industry, have, that has been a goal of, them, of theirs for you know, ever since they were little. The fact that they're now seeing it to fruition and, and being a part of that and enabling young women to be like, oh, I'm going to grow up learning that you know, Katie Sowers is a female coach in the, in the NFL. I want to be that way and that like, they have something to strive for, so I think that's awesome. Kind of the mantra's always been, if, if they can see her, they can be her. And so seeing these young women who are in these incredible roles that usually were male-dominated shows that we can do it and we have the ability to make a difference. Uh, everything to me is about visibility. You know, it's, if you can't look up and see people and see women doing what you want to do, it's really hard to envision getting there yourself. If one person can do it, five people can do it, and then ten people can do it. So it's just further progressing the idea of what women can do in a male-dominated world. Let me tell you, I was blown away by what they had to say. Not only in that quick interview we got from them, but also hearing them speak in my classes and the discussions. They are truly role models for every woman going into the sport industry. Well, when we come back, we'll see if Elon should start a men's lacrosse team with Tellier leading the way. We'll be right back. If I had to pick something that I'm taking from Elon, I want to take that can-do mentality. I don't think the world needs another person talking about how many problems we have. I think the world needs people who are going to go out there and do something about them. Coming into college, I knew that I wanted to do some kind of journalism and broadcast capacity with has to do with sports. I also come from a big sports family. Everyone else went to really big ACC schools and I wanted that, but on a smaller scale and Elon provided just that. I loved their communication school. I loved how innovative it was, what they were doing here, all of the amenities they have, the studios and cameras was super appealing to me. I accepted Elon just because, you know, I was kind of eager and just really wanted to just start getting into it. Uh, and Elon really gave me the best opportunity. I just got an email after I was accepted and uh, they said, hey, do you want to be uh, part of the Maroon Sports Broadcasting cohort? And I said, yeah, of course. Being in the cohort taught me a lot of things that I didn't even no, I didn't know or was even interested in. Um, it gave a lot of really cool opportunities that I don't think I would have gotten without being in the cohort. I was really all in and doing really everything I could, uh, and they really kind of jump-started me in getting the opportunities I wanted. I'm so glad I joined these organizations, not only to gain experience, 
but to gain friendships and also people that I can rely on and I know that I'll be working with in the future when we're all in the professional world. We understand the grind and the hustle of being a sports video person. Um, so these are the people that I'll continue to be friends with after school and also that are gonna help me in the professional realm. I think what Elon Sports Vision can do is give them a wide array of opportunities and show them all of the different possibilities that are available in the sports video world. A bigger school that's maybe more prestigious for sports broadcast, you would never get these opportunities because they're all professional guys or graduates that are, are trying to make it big and get to the next level. And so your underclassmen or your undergraduates don't have the opportunities that uh, we're given here at Elon. I think Elon Sports Vision is, you know, a place where really anyone can just come and have that passion be fueled. I didn't come to Elon to check a box or to fulfill requirements to study conventionally. I came for the experiential components. I came for the people. I didn't come to Elon to check a box or to fulfill requirements to study conventionally. I came for the experiential components. I came for the people. Welcome back here on Elon Phoenix Weekly. I'm Jay Vic Blake. Elon basketball wrapped up the 2020 regular season on Saturday in Williamsburg, Virginia, losing to William & Mary 86-79 to finish their campaign at 11-20. It was a new era for the Phoenix, which saw first-year head coach Mike Schrage lead Elon to a seventh-place finish in the CAA, the same position they finished a year ago when they lost to 10-seeded UNCW in the first round. But this year wasn't even ever seen as a year where they can make that magical first-ever run to a CAA title. Yes, they had grand trends for Marcus Sheffield, who for most of this year carried the Phoenix. 2019-2020 was a year of growth and learning, and there's no need to look any further than the freshman class. Hunter McIntosh, Hunter Woods, and Zach Irvin are all true freshmen. But there's no way you ever could have figured that out from watching them play. All three averaged above 20 minutes per game and were mainstays in the lineup. That was until Irvin was sidelined with an injury just after the midway point of the year. But McIntosh was a force, averaging 11.5 points a game while shooting above 40% from the field. Woods was right behind him, averaging 9.8 a game while leading Elon in rebounding. Irvin, in 24 games before his injury, averaged 8.4 a game. In total, that adds up to three of the top four leading scorers having a full season of being unleashed upon the CAA. All three are returning, and what they bring to the table is experience and an advanced knowledge of Shroggy's system. Sure, some can spin this year as a lost season that saw Marcus Sheffield spend his one season at Elon on a team that finished the regular season nine games under the 500 mark, but that's a short-sighted view. Take a look at this freshman class and remind yourself that these kids are barely able to legally vote. They got to spend a year playing against a conference that they can dominate for the next three years and learn from a player that spent his years prior to Elon playing in the Pac-12. Now this year might be one that sees Elon bow out in round one of the CAA tournament, but mark my word, this team is locked and loaded for a run that potentially sees them cut down the nets and make their way to March Madness for the first time ever in the next three years. Well, thanks, Javik, and I know every student here at Elon is hoping to see those nets get cut down before they graduate. Well, Tell Your Tutorials is back with fun new content. In this first episode, I teamed up with Elon's women's lacrosse team to see if I could play some goalie against some of their best players. Let's see if I lived up to expectations. All right, here with Ali Cerrone and another episode of Tell Your Tutorials talking about women's lacrosse. Now, Ali, how did you get into goalkeeping? Um, in eighth grade, I started playing lacrosse and I went and talked to the coach and she was basically like, we need a goalkeeper. And I was like, all right. So it just came down yep. to we need a spot filled, you gotta step up to the challenge. Do you think height has anything to do with being a goalkeeper? Clearly not. <laughs> I'm a little small. Um, but it definitely can help, but I'm quick, so I use that to my advantage. And what, through your years, have you liked about goalkeeping? I like being the last line of defense, you know, like the pressure of are you gonna make the save or not. It's very exhilarating. Yeah, and that pressure sometimes 
you don't all you don't stop every shot. So what what's your mental process going through, like bouncing back from from a goal? You just always got to have the mentality of on to the next. You can't dwell on anything, especially as a goalkeeper. It drags you down a little. So. All right. Well, I've got my sweatpants tucked yes. into my socks, so I think that's the first step. Yes. You ready to just model about what sure. you need to work on? All right. So what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna want to have your top hand right below the where the neck meets the shaft. What if I'm Okay, so like this. Oh, lefty. Lefty goalies are typically really good. So you're gonna have your hands up. You want the stick um, like sorta of in like the peripheral right here. And you're gonna wanna have knees bent, athletic position, just ready for a shot. Hands up. What? <laughs> You got it. I'm supposed to move to one side? <laughs> oh, no. What? Okay, so what's, and we're just dropping it. What if it's on my right side? You're either gonna wanna, st you wanna get your body behind it. That's an important thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. display as a righty. So you're always gonna wanna have like a gather step to get your body there. Okay. So see how my body's in front and of you're, the post. You're a couple of feet in front. Yes. Okay. I like playing typically like, like two feet off the line. Um, and if it's kind of a decision you have to make in the moment of if you're gonna go under or if you're gonna go over. But the most important thing is just get your body there. Top chatter. I want it. See it. Oh! What a save! And then when someone, so say you have like a free position coming at you. Yes. What are you thinking about from either spot? Um. Well, you can kind of guess where they're gonna go from most of them. So if they're down here, you know, like where they're looking, they don't have much here, so they're probably gonna try to shoot opposite pipe, and you also have to keep in mind if they're right-handed or left-handed. Um, same thing down here. Okay. Right. Oh! <laughs> Good save! <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's a natural. Try to try to hold your ground. Embrace it. Embrace the it hurts shot. more when it hits the back of the net than when it hit, hits you. Right? Oh. oh. Yeah. I, Tyler's the defender with you. Go. Oh. <laughs> oh, what a save! That was so lucky. <laughs> that was so lucky. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, you gotta stay ready. It worked! Nope. Oh! <laughs> oh, alright. There you go. Yep. And on a good doubt. Oh, <laughs> thanks to May McGlynn, Cassie Creighton, Ali Cerrone, everyone else. <laughs> and Paulina Napata! And Paulina Napata! I know! I want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, I got one bruise, uh, so that's good, but thanks for joining me. Uh, sorry, I'm going to tell you. Or did I just see you get megged out there? I did, I did. And I think it's pretty safe to say that if we do get a men's lacrosse team, mm -hmm. I will not be playing. Yeah, let's stick to baseball maybe. It might yeah, be let's do that. a little safer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for tuning in to the first spring episode of 2020. If you missed anything or want to see any packages again, check us out on YouTube at youtube.com slash Elon Phoenix Weekly. Head to elonphoenix.com to learn more about upcoming games and exciting successes for Elon Athletics. And don't forget to tune in next time for another exciting episode of Elon Phoenix Weekly. I'm Taylor Schmidt. And I'm Taylor Lundquist. See you next time.